Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about synthesis of carboxylic acids. Now, it's not going to be the exhaustive list with all different reactions that are physically possible to make carboxylic acids, but we are going to go over the four main reactions that you are expected to know within the scope of a sophomore organic chemistry, so those are definitely the ones that your instructor will expect you to know for the exam. Now, when it comes to the synthesis of carboxylic acids, we are going to be looking at two different synthetic strategies. The first strategy is going to preserve the number of carbons that you have in your molecule, and those are going to be our various oxidation reactions. And the second strategy is going to change the number of carbons in your molecule. Those are going to be either the reactions that are going to be adding carbons to your molecule, such as reactions involving the Grignard reagent and reactions involving nitriles. Those reactions are typically going to be adding one carbon to your chain. Or we're also going to be looking at reactions that are going to be potentially removing carbons from your chain. Those are going to be various oxidative cleavages, and mainly we're going to be talking about the azanolysis reactions when it comes to this type of a chemistry. And azanolysis can either cut one carbon from your chain if your double or triple bond is going to be sitting at the end of your molecule, or they can potentially cut multiple atoms off your chain, so it really depends on the molecule itself and the nature of the compound that we are dealing with. Potentially, we are not even going to lose any atoms, but we'll look at those examples in a few moments here. So let's look at these reactions one by one, starting with the oxidation of alcohols and aldehydes. Just like I explained in my oxidation of alcohols video, if we are going to start with a primary alcohol, we can potentially oxidize it all the way to a carboxylic acid. However, we gotta remember that in the process of this oxidation, the aldehyde is always going to be an intermediate. So if you have an aldehyde as a starting material, the aldehyde can be just as well oxidized to a carboxylic acid. And the common reagents that we are going to be using to accomplish this transformation is going to be either the Jones reagent, which is the chromium oxide and sulfuric acid, or a couple of modifications, which is going to be either the chromic acid itself or potassium bichromate in sulfuric acid as well. And all of these are going to be aqueous solutions. There are a few other things that could potentially pop up in your course, like let's say potassium permanganate, while all of those are valid oxidizing agents, of course, uh, the most common ones that we are going to be seeing in this case are chromium-based oxidation agents, and uh, the most common one is the Jones reagent itself, which is the classic version of that is going to be our chromium oxide in sulfuric acid. Now, a couple of things that you want to remember about this reaction is that the reaction is not particularly chemoselective, which means that if you have multiple alcohols in your molecule, all the eligible alcohols that you can have there, all of those guys will will be oxidized. So, for instance, let's say I have an alcohol like this. I have a secondary alcohol over here, and I also have a primary alcohol. Well, both of these alcohols are going to be oxidized in this reaction, so my primary alcohol is going to give me my carboxylic acid, and my secondary alcohol this guy over here, that one is going to give me a ketone because it cannot be oxidized any further. Which means that if I try to do this reaction, my final product would look like this, where I have a ketone uh, that came from my secondary alcohol, and I have my carboxylic acid that is the result of the oxidation of the primary alcohol. Likewise, if I have an aldehyde somewhere in my molecule, that function group is not going to be safe either. For instance, if I have a starting molecule that looks like this, over here I have a secondary alcohol, and on top of that I have an aldehyde functional group as well. Well, in this case, if I were to do this reaction, then I'm going to end up with a final product that looks like this, where I have the ketone functional group, and now I have a newly formed carboxylic acid that in this particular case came from the aldehyde and not from any alcohol in my molecule. So keep that in mind when you're planning your organic synthesis, because otherwise you can potentially end up with way more carbonyls than you initially anticipated. Now, the next common method of carboxylic acid synthesis is going to be the hydrolysis of nitriles. And nitrile is a functional group where you have a C N triple bond, which actually technically classified as the derivative of a carboxylic acid, despite the fact that it has chemistry that has nothing to do with carboxylic acids for the most part. Anyhow, whenever we have nitriles in our molecule, we can easily hydrolyze them in acidic conditions 
or with a little bit of persuasion in basic conditions to give us carboxylic acids. But the first question that we need to answer here is how exactly are we going to add the nitrile to our molecule? And the answer is actually very simple. We are going to do that via a simple SN2 reaction. So if I have some sort of alkyl halide, let's say I'm going to start with, I don't know, butyl bromide like this, I can do an SN2 reaction using something like potassium cyanide KCN, and if I'm doing that in the SN2 conditions, so I'm going to have the appropriate solvent, let's say DMSO or DMF or maybe tetrahydrofurane or whatever else, doesn't matter, we can have the cyanide coming in and replacing the bromine in our reaction just like so, giving me the following nitrile. And here is something very important here that you need to notice. We are adding an extra carbon to our molecule. If I number my carbon from the left end, I have one, two, three, four carbons to begin with, but now I have one, two, three, four, five carbons over here because nitrile, CN, well, that CN brings a carbon with it. So now when I'm going to be doing my hydrolysis, I can do it either in acidic media by using aqueous acid and a little bit heat, that going to give me the following carboxylic acid. And again, my carbon number five is right over here and I keep it color coded how, how I had it from the very beginning. So the rest of my chain is one, two, three, four is right here. And we can also do this hydrolysis in basic media. So if I use some sort of a base, like let's say sodium hydroxide or maybe potassium hydroxide, I will have to use much, much harsher conditions, but that will also give me almost the carboxylic acid. And I say almost carboxylic acid because if we are working in basic conditions, we are going to end up with the carboxylate, which is a negatively charged species where we have a minus charge on the oxygen over here, which means that to bring it back to the carboxylic acid and finish our synthesis, we will have to do the acidic workup, which is just going to be some sort of acid uh, in aqueous conditions, which will give us our final product after a simple proton transfer. Now, this synthetic pathway has a few limitations. The first of which being the fact that we are bringing an extra carbon with this synthetic pathway. So whenever you are planning a synthesis, you do need to take into account the fact that you are going to be bringing an extra carbon into your chain, so you absolutely have to count that. The next thing that is also important to keep in mind here is our SN2 step, which is the part of the reaction where the cyanide is going to be attacking our alkyl halide. Since SN2 reactions are extremely sensitive towards any kind of steric hindrances or anything that can potentially block the backside attack, these reactions are not possible on the tertiary alkyl halides, which means that we are limited to primary or secondary alkyl halides only. If you try to do this reaction on a tertiary alkyl halide, unfortunately you will not be successful because, as I've mentioned before, the SN2 reactions, they do not happen at any appreciable rate on the tertiary atoms, so for our purposes that's pretty much going to mean that we are at the dead end at that point. And finally, one other limitation that I have here is the temperature that we are going to have to use for the basic hydrolysis here. The basic hydrolysis is significantly harsher than the acidic hydrolysis, so keep that in mind that in real life many organic molecules will not tolerate very high temperatures, which means that if you are working with a temperature sensitive molecule, you could potentially destroy your molecule in the course of this reaction. So when you can, you should always opt with the acidic hydrolysis rather than with the basic hydrolysis. Although for our purposes, typically that's not going to be an issue, and if you are trying to do this reaction on the exam or in the homework, chances are you can use either basic or acidic hydrolysis interchangeably, and it's really not going to matter for our purposes here. Now, the next and probably the most universal way of the carboxylic acid synthesis is going to be the Grignard reaction. If we start with some sort of alkyl halide, and we treat that with magnesium shavings in THF or ether solvent, we are going to end up with the corresponding Grignard reagent. Now, if we take this Grignard reagent and treat that with carbon dioxide, CO2, 
then these two species can easily react with each other with the green yard attacking the carbon and making a new carbon-carbon bond, which is going to give us the corresponding carboxylate. Then we are going to treat that carboxylate with the acidic workup conditions. So some sort of aqueous acid, the nature of that acid is not particularly important for us. We are going to end up with our carboxylic acid. And here the same important thing that we need to keep in mind as in the last case is the number Number of carbons in your molecule. We start with one, two, three, four carbon chain in this particular example, but we ended up with one, two, three, four, five carbon chain. The new carbon that we have brought in here, this carbon that we have over here for our carboxylic acid, this is the carbon that we brought in with our carbon dioxide. So make sure that, again, you are counting your carbons very carefully and not losing or adding more carbons that you need in your chain, because when you are planning your synthesis, the proper carbon count is crucial here. Now, the cool part about our green reagent here is that we are not limited by the nature of carbons where our halide is uh, located. We can use primary, secondary, tertiary alkyl halide or even sp2 hybridized halides. So if let's say I start with bromobenzene where I have my bromine sitting directly on the aromatic ring and the SN2 substitution here is just going to be physically impossible, here I can still make a green reagent by reacting my bromobenzene with magnesium and then if I treat my resulting green reagent with carbon dioxide in the form of dry ice for instance and then do my acidic workup, I will end up making a carboxylic acid just like I originally wanted. So this way I can make a carboxylic acid from way more targets than the uh, reaction with the nitrile would allow me to. However, the Grignard reaction is not without limitations either. The Grignard reagent is an extremely strong base, which means that it cannot coexist with anything that is even a little bit acidic within the molecule or the system itself. And functional groups such as alcohols, thiols, amines, and even terminal alkynes are way too acidic to peacefully coexist with the green yard, which means that the alkyl halide that you are trying to make cannot, absolutely cannot contain any of these functional groups when you are attempting to make your green yard reagent. And of course, your starting material should not contain any other carbonyls, because otherwise your green yard reagent can just start reacting within the molecule itself and give you something completely different from what you are expecting. So if you have any other carbonyls in your molecule, those guys must be protected. Luckily, all of these limitations can be easily circumvented by using the proper synthesis planning and maybe an occasional protecting group if you need to. And the last method that I want to talk about is going to be the azanolysis of either alkenes or alkynes. If you are trying to make a carboxylic acid out of an alkene, then you absolutely need to have hydrogens sitting on the alkene that you are trying to cleave with your azanolysis. The conditions for our cleavage are going to be step number one is going to be ozone itself, so O3, and step number two is going to be the oxidative workup, which uses aqueous hydrogen peroxide H2O2, which going to give you a combination of the carboxylic acids based on whatever starting material you have. The hydrogens that you have on your alkene from the very beginning are crucial here because if you do not have hydrogens, you are going to end up with the corresponding ketone and not the carboxylic acid. The only way you can get your carboxylic acid if you have those hydrogens this guy and this guy sitting on your alkene. Without those hydrogens, the result is going to be a ketone and not the carboxylic acid. Now, when it comes to alkynes, well, cleavage of these guys is a little bit easier. We are going to be cutting through our triple bond and conditions here are going to be just ozone and we don't need any special workup here. That is just going to be water to break up the intermediate that we are going to get in the course of this reaction. And the result is always going to be a pair of carboxylic acids, depending on what your starting material looks like. 
like. Now, the important thing that you want to keep in mind about this reaction is that we are cleaving some carbons from our molecule, so your chain is most likely going to end up being shorter. This is not particularly carbon efficient uh, either, and because of that, we tend to avoid this synthetic procedure when we are dealing with synthesis of carboxylic acids. However, sometimes instructors kind of like to add that as a multi-step synthesis quirk and uh, try to put a creative spin on a question or something like that if you like. So while typically we are probably not going to be expecting ozonolysis as the premier way of making carboxylic acids, I have seen questions like that on the exams before, so it can potentially show up. The only time when ozonolysis is actually extremely useful in the synthesis of the carboxylic acid is when we are trying to make a dicarboxylic acid by cutting a ring. For instance, if let's say I have cyclohexene, well, I can cut this double bond over here, and because of that, I will end up with a dicarboxylic acid on a long chain. So if I do my step number one, which is going to be my ozone, and step number two is going to be my oxidative workup, which is going to be hydrogen peroxide in this case, we are going to end up with the molecule looking like this. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons to begin with, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in our final product as well. So in cases like that, ozonolysis is actually extremely useful. But as I said, you're probably going to be looking at the Grignard reaction or oxidation of alcohols as the two main methods of making your carboxylic acids rather than ozonolysis or the um, hydrolysis of nitriles. This list, as I've mentioned, is of course not exhaustive. There are plenty of other methods that we can see within the scope of our course. There is a benzylic oxidation that can give you aromatic carboxylic carboxylic acids, we have a cleavage of vicinal diols, we have hydrolysis of various carboxylic acid derivatives, and so on. There is plenty more methods, but these four are the most common ones that we are going to expect students to use on the exams and in the homeworks. So I suggest you always try to use one of these methods before you try to do something a little bit fancier. And in my experience, that will be sufficient in like 99% of the cases. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, you can tell me that by hitting the like button and leaving me a comment below. Your likes and comments really help in promoting these videos so more students can see them. Subscribe to the channel for more organic chemistry updates and tutorials. Watch this video next and I'll see you next time.